The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Good morning. Uh, my talk this morning is going to be, uh, as it states there, uh, about pilgrimage. And um, first question I'd like to do is kind of introduce us to the kind of broad scope uh, within this kind of milieu which when we're within which within we're situated uh, when we talk about pilgrimage as this kind of overarching global phenomenon. Um, and the first question I would pose to you is, um, you know, besides being pilgrims, as we kind of, as I sort of laid out there in the title, what do these people have in common, right? Uh, we see people in different um, uh, sort of actions here, and here are the places that they're all sort of associated with, right? So they're all going to a certain place, right? So the first one, obviously, on the left here, this is the Kaaba in Mecca. We have St. James Compostela in Spain the Mahabodhi Temple in India, and of course, Graceland in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, so questions I'd like to ask uh, to kind of frame our conversation today really uh, center around kind of problematizing some of these notions that we've inherited uh, with this term pilgrimage. Um, we're surrounded by it uh, in our popular culture today. Uh, we've got all kinds of examples. Um, We've got uh, National Geographic uh, magazines, and um, this is a French magazine that's come. It's a themed magazine that just came out a month ago. Um, you know, and and we're surrounded with images uh, of pilgrimage, people going on these great travels and journeys to different places uh, throughout the world. And so I just I think that uh, this lecture is an opportunity to kind of uh, you know try to begin to understand those some of those issues. Um, it's, it is a very contemporary phenomenon still, um, even though the bulk of this lecture will be a historical uh, discussion. The, I would like to situate it within a contemporary framework of, um, be, because it's very relevant today. I mean, as this is from the National Geographic uh, website, which was also published in a magazine a few months ago, which talks about um, global pilgrimage, really. It tries to kind of, elicit uh, kind of it sort of essentializes a lot of different pilgrimages around the world and um, it highlights and on their website they actually have a um, an interactive map where you can click and read all about the different types of pilgrimages around the world um, and you know again just to kind of remind us of the contemporary contemporariness really of the situ of, of pilgrimage it does have over 300 million travelers per year are traveling on some kind of faith tourism or religious pilgrimage of some sort. And it is an $18 billion a year revenue in generating industry. So this is something that's extremely um, um, relevant. And so here's the National Geographic interactive map and you can kind of click on all these different places and try to gain an understanding. Uh, and so we, we can understand pilgrimage as this, as you know, occurring all over the world. But for our sake, for this lecture, I think it's very important to kind of hone in on, on uh, focus on some specific traditions. So today we're going to be looking at an example from Egypt, uh, early Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. Um, but first I'd like to kind of problematize what pilgrimage is, what it means, uh, what's going on here. Um, the um, the question is, what is a pilgrimage, right? So it's usually a journey of some sort. Somebody's traveling to some degree uh, to see some sacred or some holy, either a relic or a space or something. Um, and these people usually pay some kind of homage or respect. Uh, and they, they, they perform this journey um, out of some kind of sense of a duty or some kind of responsibility. There's something that kind of you know, gets them to go on it. Uh, and what a pilgrim is, is not necessarily, um, you know, we're not really going to cover that specifically because that's more of a sort of an anthropological thing, but we, we are going to address a couple issues related to pilgrims because they are obviously very diverse and they're the reason that pilgrimages exist. So um, to some extent, we need to understand that 
what a pilgrim is and who, who they are, very basically. Um, and I've tried to kind of outline or reduce some of the themes of pilgrimage to three kind of very basic um, um, kind of ideas. So there's the faith, obviously, which is involved. And this is not necessarily religious. Uh, it can be uh, some kind of spiritual entity or personage, as I mentioned, can be religious or secular, as we saw with Elvis already. Um, people can believe in something related to somebody. Um, but most importantly, there's a desire to do something about it. And so um, that's where movement comes in. And so movement, we can basically understand it as this, this whether, um, you know, in some traditions we're going to talk about circumambulation and some, some uh, traditions we're going to talk about procession. But there's this constant thread of movement, which is kind of a thread within all of these different traditions. There's something's moving, right? Whether it's the sacred or the, or the profane, or whether it's people, or whether it's an object, things are, things are constantly moving, which is obviously very important for us spatially. Uh, and of course, that brings me to the differentiation of space. And so space really uh, is a key to this, um, this understanding, uh, understanding the differences in the conceptions of space between these different traditions, and how the different traditions understand this notion of the sacred and the profane, right? So we, we've kind of inherited this very, this, you know, very dualistic uh, diagram of the sacred versus the profane, right? They're always kind of like opposed to one another uh, if, in our kind of traditional understanding. You're either sacred or profane. Spaces can be sacred or profane. And so what I would really like to do is challenge our understanding of that. And this is, again, this is the sort of traditional path that a pilgrim takes, right? They move from the profane through or into the sacred, and then they come back to their profane existence, somehow transformed. So how does that transformation occur? Again, anthropology here does a little bit of a job, and they sort of help me out with this understanding. Uh, the anthropologists have been studying this since, like, really the 60s. And so um, there's three quick stages of, of a pilgrimage uh, journey that I'd like to kind of elicit here. And this is the preliminal, liminal, and postliminal, right? So we, the anthropologists kind of liken this to a, a graduation ceremony where the preliminal is the separation phase, right? Where students are with their parents and they're kind of milling about. And then they all kind of, they get their robes on, right? So they're differentiating themselves. Then they all go sit in the middle of the, uh, in the middle, they are separated from their parents and families. They sit there. Then they're in this liminal phase where there's this transitional phase where people give their you know lectures and they talk about how great the class is and what happened that year and all these things. And so um, then this notion of communitas kind of evolves out of that, right? So there's this feeling of a community that they're together with people. And so um, very basically, you you the anthropologists talk about how there's this um, together feeling that they're doing something together. And then the post-liminal is the reincorporation into society. You have thus graduated, you've been given your degree, and now you're reincorporated into society as an individual. You, you're part of this community of people with a degree, right? So this is kind of, but I'd like us to keep in mind this notion of communitas as we move forward. Um, the first um, kind of example here in, um, slide 16, is the, uh, we're going to look at a sort of an ancient example in the New Kingdom of, um, in Egypt, uh, the Karnak. And so this is ba very basically where it's located um, in Africa. And um, this is a procession, basically it's, it's, it's a very early form of pilgrimage. And um, really it takes on this notion of the, of the procession to a very specific, um, in a very specific manner. People aren't necessarily coming from extremely far distances to come to Thebes, this general area here that we can see. But um, there are people within Thebes that, um, and this is a very unique um, procession in that the notion of, or notion of the sacred that we talked about just briefly earlier, uh, the sacred is actually very interesting because it's co-located. There are, the temples themselves are sacred and the spaces are sacred within them, but the, there's something very interesting here where the sacred is actually moved. So the, the gods actually leave the temples and are processed through these different areas. And we can see here from this first 
uh, example. This is the, there's two main festivals I'd like to very briefly talk about. There's the OPET festival, which is this, essentially this route. All right, so very basically uh, Karnak Temple here, and then the, um, the procession, there's two different, there's a couple of different ways in which this happens. But the initial, the earlier kingdom uh, example leaves from Karnak, goes, takes the land route to Luxor, then goes in the Nile, and then come, so it comes back via the Nile. Um, and so what's happening is Amun, the god Amun, uh, is sort of, he inhabits Karnak, right? So he's removed, his image is removed, and thus their understanding of the god. So they, they put him on a bark, and then, which is the ship, and I'll show you that in a minute, but I'd like to first show you the other, this is the Feast of the Valley, and this route uh, includes, this is a little bit later because it includes the uh, Temple of Hatshepsut and the Medinet Habu over here. So this, again, and, and the, the arrows are double-headed because there's, diff in different area, eras, uh, the routes went different ways. Sometimes they went out on the water and came back on the water, and sometimes they went over the land. Um, and so here it is a, a kind of a plan view. Again, here you can see how there's uh, multiple pathways here. But the key to our understanding is, and just a couple views here, this is of the ram-headed sphinx. So this is this, you can obviously get a sense of this very hieratic um, sort of processional space that, that was occurring. Um, and so my, my kind of diagram here sort of tries to understand this notion of the sacred and the profane in this Karnak uh, example. And so I would put forward that the sacred is not, is, is not only an object here, the little sacred, which is the image of the god or the god himself, uh, but he's within the sacred temple complex. And he's literally processed through profane spaces to go visit his son, Konsu, or his wife, Mut. So he's going to these different, he's processed through these different temple complexes, and eventually he ends up back in another sacred space. So uh, what happens is that the people of, um, the people in the procession actually pick up the bark. So this is an example here of the bark, and then the image of the godhead is inside, and thus the belief is that the god is there, he's present there. They've removed him from the inner sanctum of the temple, and he's processed through space. And so here, all the celebrations, they have people are bringing cattle with them, and here we can see play, people playing a lute-like object. So there's, a, and this is an artist's rendering of the of a large bark on the river, on the Nile, and then within it, you can see the small bark with the image of the god, um, god within it. So, and it's very interesting. I'd like to just very quickly, briefly read. Um, Herodotus saw one of these processions at one point, um, our friend, the Greek historian. Uh, and he describes it very interestingly. He says, the Egyptians hold their solemn assemblies not once in the year, but often. Now, when they are coming to the city of Bubastis, they do as follows. They sail men and women together in a great multitude of each sex in every boat. And some of the men have rattles and rattle with them, while some of the men play the flute during the whole time of the voyage. And the rest, both men and women, sing and clap their hands. And when, as, and when as they sail, they come opposite to any city on the way. They bring the boat to land, and some of the women continue to do as I have said. Others cry aloud and jeer at the women in the city. Some dance and some stand up and pull, their, pull up their garments. This they do by every city along the river bank. And when they come to Bubastis, they hold festivals celebrating great sacrifices, and more wine of grapes is consumed upon that festival than, than during the whole rest of the year. So um, you can see here that these, and, and, um, these individuals in these reliefs that are out of the Luxor Temple and the, and the Karnak, these are just a variety of reliefs kind of showing, kind of outlining this, this processional activity. And these priests are called Wab priests. Um, and uh, yeah. the... Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. The the next tradition that uh, we would like to we're going to take a look at here um, differs to quite some extent, um, and this is Buddhism. Now we've already talked about the Buddha and his his um, his origins and and the kind of origins of Buddhism and the the fact that it uh, begins in India and it kind of spreads uh, throughout Asia. Um, and so we've covered that, but what I'd like to come back to now is this notion of pilgrimage with Buddhism. And um, 
the um, you know, as we've talked about before, we've talked about the eightfold path and what it means to you know enlightenment. We've discussed uh, the ideas of the stupa and what those are, um, and the variety of traditions. Obviously, here this is an example from Thailand of of a Buddhist uh, procession. This is also an, an example um, of a um, a Buddhist shrine in Myanmar. And this this I just show this slide basically because. Um, there's this notion in Buddhism that I've come across of um, the kind of difficulty associated with the path is warrants more. An, there's like an accumulation of merit. There's this a kind of the harder the path, the more of a struggle, the greater the attainment of some kind of spiritual or um, kind of merit, I guess, is for lack of a better term. Um, but really, I'd like to point us to the uh, the scriptural basis and motivation um, within Buddhism. Um, and here, the Buddha is uh, um, believed to have said to called for the the pilgrimage to four main sites. So he says um, here the Tathagata, uh, which is um, he's referring to himself, the perfected one. He says that. The first is where he was born. The second is where he attained supreme enlightenment. Uh, the fourth is where the third is where he set in the wheel of Dharma, the where he gave his first lecture, and then the fourth is where he um, passed away into Nirvana, where he died. And so, these uh, to 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 kind of illustrate some of the the themes around Buddhist pilgrimage that sort of begin to define it. Um, are that this early notion of Buddhist pilgrimage is based around the Buddha's life. So many people will travel to these different sacred places uh, in, in the order in which they happened. Not necessarily from what I've come across, but it is sometimes, uh, if somebody's going to do the entire route, they'll go, the, they'll go to everyone in that order. Uh, and so you're sort of traveling in this path of the Buddha, of a, of a holy individual. You're kind of recreating their... You're re trying to re-experience their life, essentially. Um, and there are relics within these different places. So um, the presence or the sacred throughout the land is sort of dispersed throughout the landscape. Um, and circumambulation is a big, is a key feature to Buddhism. There's um, a lot of circumambulation as a kind of a spiritual, um, um, as a sort of spiritual reflection. Uh, and also the accumulation of merit for long and difficult journeys, which I've already just uh, briefly discussed. Um, the four main locations uh, oops, uh, are Lumbini, um, Sarnath, Bodhgaya, and um, Kushnagar, which um, are the sites that we'll be looking at um, specifically. But before we get into that, again, I would like to kind of, I'm trying to, you know, come back to our notion of the sacred and the profane with each of these examples. And this is just another diagram kind of trying to outline the way in which, you know, one way at least in which we can view um, an understanding of the sacred and profane in early Buddhist pilgrimage. And so here again, we have these kind of sacred nodes and we passed through them, through the profane to get to get to each one. And, and, and like I said earlier, there's not a a, um, a specific manner in which that happens. But this becomes more complicated when um, Buddha's relics are distributed into over 80,000 places, and um, this, it becomes a little bit more complicated later. But for now, we're kind of trying to focus on the early uh, aspects. The, um, the first, um, this is the birthplace of the Buddha uh, in Lumbini, which is present-day Nepal. Uh, he was born in 563, approximately, and um, located in the foothills of the Himalayas. And uh, what we see here on the left is an Ashokan pillar, uh, which marks the birthplace of the Buddha. And you can see it, you can see the uh, monks and other pilgrims kind of circumambulating around it. Uh, and then on the right, we have a reflecting pool with a, a more recent uh, temple. The second example is this is where the Buddha delivered his first meeting where people come to pilgrimage. They also circumambulate this stupa. This is the Dharmic stupa, uh, again, built by Ashoka uh, in the third century. So essentially, the great Ash Emperor Ashoka came and sort of created all these, built all these monuments to commemorate uh, the Buddha. And so um, 
the third place is one of the most holy. It's where he uh, achieved enlightenment. Uh, next, under the Bodhi tree, uh, which is what this temple, the Bodhgaya, the um, at Bodhgaya, the Mahabodhi temple, uh, commemorates. This is a brick structure, um, and it is <clears throat> approximately 180 feet tall. And um, the brickwork um, depicts scenes from the life of the Buddha, and this is where he really is transformed from Prince Gautama to the Lord Buddha. Um, so this is an extremely important um, location for pilgrims. This is a footprint sculpture of the Buddha's feet uh, and also a pilgrim inside commemorating uh, the life of the Buddha. The last place is the uh, is Kushnagar, which is where the Buddha passed away. Um, on the bottom we see a six meter long statue that was excavated in the 19th century. Um, and um, the Buddha's remains were at one point deposited here under the Nirvana Stupa. Um, and um, basically, this is where he performed his last sermon and subsequently passed away. So <clears throat> as we move forward, we, we're going to take a look at um, the tradition of Islam and pilgrimage, which I sort of argue here in my title is Consolidation and Globalization of Pilgrimage. And um, I say that because um, in Islam, no matter where you are, you are essentially required to go to Mecca to make the pilgrimage or the Hajj. Um, and this obviously entails, can, can entail quite a bit of, um, of travel. And so uh, similar to Buddhism, uh, Islam is scripturally based it's in the Quran. It's also the fifth pillar of Islam, which uh, requires most, all Muslims to go make the um, Hajj. And so here we just have a very basic, very uh, quick slide um, to slide 38 to indicate, um, to show the significance of, of the Kaaba in Mecca. I'm going to get back to this in a minute here. But what's occurring is circumambulation. Again, we can see with the, the kind of long exposure photograph here of the movement around the Kaaba. Um, and so my diagram is naturally one that is very, um, very much about co um, congregating into one specific sacred holy place, right? So it's a very basic diagram that tries to just at least articulate this idea that um, we're all coming from these different profane spaces, but we all, when we come together uh, in Mecca, this is the sacred, it's the, the moment of the sacred. And so just some very basic uh, characteristics. Um, I don't want to get into these too much, but um, circumambulation again. But uh, one of the biggest things I'd like to uh, discuss here is this notion of communitas again, um, which Really, the Hajj takes place once a year, and you it is performed communally. So this is a very big aspect of it. I mean, it's not to say that you can't go on the Hajj the rest of the year, but it's uh, still required that you make the Hajj as a as a communal thing, um, the official Hajj at, at once. And so um, this notion is kind of very important. It's very central to Islam. And so the three main locations, which obviously the most important is Mecca. Uh, which is the Al-Masjid Al-Haram, which is the sacred mosque, uh, which is the, the Kaaba is located within that. Uh, the other two main sites for pilgrimage uh, that are not required for Islam are uh, Medina, where the house of the Prophet or the mosque of the Prophet is located, and also in Jerusalem uh, with the Dome of the Rock. This is just a quick, a brief, interesting um, map from the 10th century by the geographer Al-Jihani, who uh, indicates to us, the viewer, how important Mecca is to Islam, how it's, he literally is drawing it as the center of the world. And this is just a quick graphic I found uh, that uh, shows, again, it's, uh, it's interesting because it, my diagram sort of abstracts this in a way. This is literally the amount of uh, percentage of people coming from different locations throughout the world uh, coming to the Hajj in 1982. So it's just a kind of a quick graphic to, so you can easily see where, where the a great number of Muslims are coming from. 
Um, it would be interesting to see a more recent version of that, obviously, um, given the change in population locations. Um, this is an this is an abstracted uh, plan of the mosque, the Al Haram Mosque, and um, really up to the year 785. So it's a very basic mosque. The Kaaba is in the center, and it's beginning to acquire this kind of colonnade uh, around it. And so by the 18th century. Um, the Kaaba is here located centrally. You can see the colonnade is pretty well established around it, and the city is filling in pretty densely around it as well. And this is what it is basically contemporarily uh, today as it looks today. And so um, this is as it is today during the Hajj, um, full of pilgrims. Again, another view. And this is... Um, this is the kiswa, this is the, the black silk cloth that covers that this site is very sacred to Islam for a number of reasons, but basic, very quickly and basically, um, Ibrahim or Abraham is said to have uh, left his wife and son um, Ismail here very briefly while he went to Palestine, and um, Ismail discovered, or you know, it's a long story, but he discovered a spring here, this holy well of Zamzam. And so um, not only is that significant, and then obviously, um, well, not obviously, but Allah instructed Ibrahim to create a, to build this structure to commemorate him. And so uh, he did that, and he, this is also uh, supposedly the tomb of Abraham as well. So there are, and there are all kinds of other um, significant associations with this. Um, and so here, this is just a quickly show um, some pilgrims performing the Hajj, uh, where they're coming from and where they're going. And this is obviously a very dense packed street here because there's, it's a highly ritualized, um, highly ritualized um, um, reenactments and circumambulation. There's all kinds of interesting uh, things going on here. Again, this is the, well, this is the village um, of tents at Mina near, nearby Mecca. So these are all tents. And this, can, this space can essentially uh, um, contain about 3 million pilgrims when they come to perform the Hajj. Um, and then another quick interesting thing I, I found is these are all uh, images of uh, house paintings displaying evidence of having completed the Hajj. So like if you've completed the Hajj or Haji, and you celebrate that by either a painting or, you know, it, at least in these kind of very localized uh, examples. Um, and so here's a, a, an image here on the left side of the Kaaba that this person has obviously completed the Hajj. And this is, uh, this is Burak, the, the horse that Muhammad rode into um, heaven. Very briefly, this is the Prophet's Mosque in Medina as it looks today. So again, it's full of pilgrims. People are coming here all throughout the year. Um, another central um, uh, monument to Islam is the Dome of the Rock, which we're really not going to spend any time with, but I just wanted to show it very briefly. This commemorates uh, several things as well. Um, this is where, supposedly, the, uh, that Muhammad uh, rode the horse up into heaven, and also the point where um, it's, it's thought that uh, Abraham was about to, um, where Abraham was instructed to kill his son Isaac, and then obviously the angel interceded and prevented that. So this is also, a, a, and here's the rock. This is just a view of the rock from above. Um, So that was kind of the whirlwind tour of Islam. <laughs> um, it's obviously, you know, the, the, the struggle here is that there is so much culturally loaded in all of these examples and so much of a massive history associated with them that it's been very difficult to kind of reduce the amount of, of material. Um, but that brings me to uh, some Christian examples. Uh, and this is really uh, some medieval my main focus here in this presentation is the medieval period um, in Christianity. And this is just on the left, a drawing from the 15th century of a pilgrim on his way. And on the right, it's a drawing by Matthew Paris. It's a sort of a map of a pilgrimage route that he performed in 1250 that uh, is interesting because it highlights it. He actually articulated, he drew all the buildings that were along the way um, that he, you know, 
all the different buildings that he visited along the way of his pilgrimage route, which I found was a very interesting and appropriate. Um, the main center or the focus of the medieval Christian pilgrimage was to St. James of Compostela, which is located out here um, in the Iberian Peninsula. And you can see here on this map, Paris, Vézelay, Le Puy, and Arles. They all, those are the kind of main centers of where the pilgrimage would start. And people would progress down these, these lines, these, uh, these essentially these pilgrim routes, uh, pilgrimage routes along and hitting different holy places along as they go. Uh, this is a reconstruction of Santiago de Compostela. And um, as it would have looked in the 11, around 1100, it's pretty interesting, it was constructed, it was developed by some students and faculty at UCLA, the architecture department. Um, I'm not sure how authentic it would be, but it's a lot better than the Baroque uh, afterthought, which is what we have right now. You can't see the, you, it's, um, they've, the Romanesque structure has been completely covered with a, a pretty much a Baroque um, structure. So this is, again, we come back to our sacred and profane diagram. Um, and this is sort of how I envision um, the movement from a sacred space uh, through the profane to uh, essentially there's this very um, linear movement to an ultimate sacred place that's you know there's there's some hierarchy here there's uh, one is process processing essentially metaphorically through this landscape of the profane and reaches these different uh, sacred spaces to which um, they can um, you know benefit by grace of some sort um, and I just, we, we can't talk about this without discussing this just massive proliferation of architecture that just was generated around this time. And so um, this is just four examples out of the book um, that show us uh, the four examples of pilgrimage churches. And you can see right away the cruciform similarity that they share, uh, the larger apses, these apsidioles, which um, where relics would be, relics would either be located within the apse here or within these absidials. Uh, and so pilgrims would be able to come in and, and sometimes they would circumambulate here or they would process in and out. Um, and very um, specifically here, we have an example from Saint-Foy in Conque in France uh, around 1120. And this is interesting because um, this, the the beginning of the story is the um, there was a monk who translated or stole um, some relics from one place uh, uh, in um, another location in France, brought them here. Essentially, everybody followed, uh, and they created this uh, large church to kind of celebrate the relics of Saint Foy, Saint Faith, who was a martyr from the third century. And here's 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 her rendered image, and I just wanted to quickly read this. Uh, by a clergyman named Bramard Danger uh, from 1010. He says, he's talking about this relic. He says, when they saw it for the first time, all in gold and sparkling with precious stones and looking like a human face, the majority of the peasants thought that the statue was really looking at them and answering their prayers with her eyes. So there's a great deal of interest around these relics, the reliquaries, and the kind of sacredness of these spaces. This is Saint Foy, and more views. Um, we can't forget that one of the um, most important pilgrimages in the medieval period was one that is obviously uh, as mixed, um, <laughs> not so mixed. Uh, it's pretty um, rather controversial uh, pilgrimage, but that is the that everyone's familiar with the Crusades, um, which essentially occurred between around here the dates that I've sort of shown. And the thing I wanted to kind of elicit out of the Crusades was this notion of exchange uh, of architectural uh, architectural techniques, right? So one thing I just want to quickly quickly discuss here is this notion. Obviously, the, the Crusades went to the Holy Lands, uh, what they believe were the Holy Lands, which were obviously Jerusalem and Bethlehem and all these places along associated with the life of Christ. Um, and so. Um, what I'm showing here depicting is the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, which uh, is using the uh, pointed arch, right? So very basically, um, the Crusaders bring back some of this technology. Um, 
that uh, pre-existed in Islam for many years before. The Crusaders bring it back and there's a, we see a quick steady development of different types of arch systems from the barrel, the Roman kind of groin vaults. Uh, and of course the importance here is there's this relationship between how high you go and how wide you are, right? That's a fixed point of relationship. But once you introduce the pointed arch, that well, anything's fair, right? So that brings me to the example of Saint Denis um, which is another pilgrimage church. This is an image, this is a, a stained glass image of Saint Denis. And so uh, this is the plan. And so we can see here in this apse, uh, the ex big additions that, um, uh, that uh, Abbot Sujet uh, went through. And I wanted to just quickly read this. Um, Video removed due to copyright restrictions. So he goes on to explain how horrendous the conditions were in viewing these relics. So he totally expands the church and you get this amazing network of uh, vaulting going on here that's brought about essentially by this newer technology of the pointed arch. And I just really wanted to quickly briefly go through uh, some more recent or contemporary things. The Santiago de Compostela is still a pilgrimage route that is still practiced today. These are all very contemporary people performing this. This is a sign in France that indicates it's 953 kilometers um, because people are still taking these pilgrimage routes. Um, and then in Lourdes in France, I wanted to just highlight the story of Bernadette Soubrius, who in 1858 saw a sighting of the Virgin Mary um, in this nowhere village uh, that didn't even have a railroad station or anything. It was extremely difficult to get there and she was an uneducated, um, illiterate peasant girl essentially so to speak who saw this vision and turned this place essentially her vision turned it into this um this key central christian uh pilgrimage location and here you can see on the bottom right a very contemporary view of pilgrims um coming here again and then bernadette dies and they turn her into a relic essentially uh so it's sort of it's very interesting this whole process that's occurring um and again, in later Christianity, we have, we, it's, it's interesting because we almost come back in a full circle back to Karnak, where, where, where we are, there's an understanding of the, the movement or the procession of the sacred. The sacred actually is moved from one location to another. And on the left, we have an example of in Poland, on the upper right in Italy, and then on the bottom right, we have the famous Semana Santa in Spain, um, the Holy Week ceremony where um, you have quite an amazing amount of proliferation of processions. Um, and more recently, we also have um, uh, more Christian processions with uh, pilgrimages to see all kinds of things, right? Rome, this whole space is all about procession and pilgrimage. Um, and if you ever want to go to any of these places, you can hop online and um, click if you're Protestant, my interest is Protestant or whatever. And then um, if you're Buddhist, you can find Buddhist pilgrimages to go to Lumbini, Bodhgaya, wherever. Um, the Hajj, of course, is you know, not a problem at all. They can do that for you. There's packages, trips from JFK. You can even rent a pilgrim, which is a medieval notion, the peregrinatio uh, pecuniae causa, which is where you would pay a, a pilgrim to go in, in your stead. Um, and this notion you can do, it's interesting, I only, I only raise this issue because it's interesting because it's connected to architecture in a very interesting way. So if you do go onto this website and rent a pilgrim, this guy will walk for you and you'll pay him and he'll do the walk and the money will go to fund the renovation of the city church, uh, St. Jacob in Rottenburg in Germany. And so it's very interesting. And then of course you get a emblem that you went on the pilgrimage right here, your scallop pendant. Um, and there are all kinds of contemporary guides to St. James. Uh, these are, this is an image of the Buddhists doing the Santiago de Compostela. So there's this kind of very interesting global thing going on here. Um, you know, just this notion of a sacred space uh, following the path of a sacred, no matter what kind of denomination or whatever it is. Um, again, uh, secular pilgrimages, not the focus necessarily of the talk, but still an important um, aspect to popular culture uh, that we're surrounded with today, JFK and Vietnam Memorial. Um, and of course, Elvis, we can't leave uh, hit Graceland out with his tomb here. And um, there's just, if the closer you look, there's just these very odd stories about people 
This is a this is a former military installation in the desert that people flock to every year and do these um, interesting sculptures. But basically, um, I think it's it's important to think about the contemporary um, contemporary pilgrimage and how it relates to the, our historical examples that we just discussed, and how it's continually readapted and interpreted through different world cultures and traditions. And um, 